The Coral Island by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter Eleven. Effects of Overeating and Reflections Thereon. Humble Advice Regarding Cold Water. The Horrible Cry Accounted For. The Curious Birds Called Penguins. Peculiarity of the Coconut Palm. Questions on the Formation of Coral Islands. Mysterious Footsteps. Strange Discoveries and Sad Sights. When we awoke on the following morning we found that the sun was already a good way above the horizon, so I came to the conclusion that a heavy supper is not conducive to early rising. Nevertheless we felt remarkably strong and well, and much disposed to have our breakfast. First, however, we had our customary morning bath, which refreshed us greatly. I have often wondered very much in after years that the inhabitants of my own dear land did not make more frequent use of this most charming element, water, I mean in the way of cold bathing. Of course I have perceived that it is not convenient for them to go into the sea or the rivers in winter, as we used to do on the Coral Island, but then I knew from experience that a large washing-tub and a sponge do form a most pleasant substitute. The feelings of freshness, of cleanliness, of vigor, and extreme hilarity that always followed my baths in the sea, and even when in England my ablutions in the wash-tub, were so delightful that I would sooner have gone without my breakfast than without my bath in cold water. My readers will forgive me for asking whether they are in the habit of bathing thus every morning, and if they answer no, they will pardon me for recommending them to begin at once. Of late years, since retiring from the stirring life of adventure which I have led so long in foreign climes, I have heard of a system called the cold-water cure. Now I do not know much about that system, so I do not mean to uphold it, neither do I intend to run it down. Perhaps in reference to it I may just hint that there may be too much of a good thing, I know not. But of this I am quite certain, that there may also be too little of a good thing and the great delight that I have had in cold bathing during the course of my adventurous career inclines me to think that it is better to risk taking too much than to content oneself with too little. Such is my opinion, derived from much experience, but I put it before my readers with the utmost diffidence and with profound modesty knowing that it may possibly jar with their feelings of confidence in their own ability to know and judge as to what is best and fittest in reference to their own affairs. But to return from this digression, for which I humbly crave forgiveness, we had not advanced on our journey much above a mile or so, and were just beginning to feel the pleasant glow that usually accompanies vigorous exercise, when, on turning a point that revealed to us a new and beautiful cluster of islands, we were suddenly arrested by the appalling cry which had so alarmed us a few nights before. But this time we were by no means so much alarmed as on the previous occasion, because, whereas at that time it was night, now it was day, and I have always found, though I am unable to account for it, that daylight banishes many of the fears that are apt to assail us in the dark. On hearing the sound, Peterkin instantly threw forward his spear. "'Now, what can it be?' said he, looking round at Jack. "'I tell you what it is. If we are to go on being pulled up in a constant state of horror and astonishment, as we have been for the last week, the sooner we're out of this island the better.' notwithstanding the yams and lemonade and pork and plums. Peterkin's mark was followed by a repetition of the cry, louder than before. "'It comes from one of these islands,' said Jack. "'It must be the point of a jackass, then,' said Peterkin, "'for I never heard anything so like.' We all turned our eyes towards the cluster of islands, where, on the largest, we observed curious objects moving on the shore. "'Soldiers they are! That's flat!' cried Peterkin, gazing at them in the utmost amazement, 
and in truth peterkin's remark seemed to me to be correct for at the distance from which we saw them they appeared to be an army of soldiers there they stood rank and file in lines and in squares marching and countermarching with blue coats and white trousers while we were looking at them the dreadful cry came again over the water and peterkin suggested it must be a regiment sent out to massacre the natives in cold blood at this remark jack laughed and said why peterkin they are penguins penguins repeated peterkin ay penguins peterkin penguins nothing more or less than big sea birds as you shall see one of these days when we pay them a visit in our boat which i mean to set about building the moment we return to our bower so then our dreadful yelling ghosts and our murdering army of soldiers remarked peterkin have dwindled down to penguins big sea birds very good then i propose that we continue our journey as fast as possible lest our island should be converted into a dream before we get completely rounded now as we continued our way i pondered much over this new discovery and the singular appearance of these birds of which jack could only give us a very slight and vague account and i began to long to commence our boat in order that we might go and inspect them more narrowly but by degrees these thoughts left me and i began to be much taken up again with the interesting peculiarities of the country which we were passing through the second night we passed in a manner somewhat similar to the first at about two-thirds of the way round the island as we calculated and we hoped to sleep on the night following at our bower i will not here note so particularly all that we said and saw during the course of the second day as we did not make any further discoveries of great importance the shore along which we travelled and the various parts of the woods through which we passed were similar to those which have been already treated of there were one or two observations that we made however and these were as follows we saw that while many of the large fruit-bearing trees grew only in the valleys and some of them only near the banks of the streams where the soil was peculiarly rich the coconut nut palm grew in every place whatsoever not only on the hillsides but also on the seashore and even as has already been stated on the coral reef itself where the soil if we may use the name was nothing better than loose sand mingled with broken shells and coral rock so near to the sea too did this useful tree grow that in many places its roots were washed away by the spray from the breakers yet we found the trees growing thus on the sands to be quite as luxuriant as those growing in the valleys and the fruit as good and refreshing also besides this i noticed that on the summit of the high mountain which we once more ascended at a different point from our first descent were found abundance of shells and broken coral formations which jack and i agreed proved either that this island must have once been under the sea or that the sea must once have been above the island in other words that as shells and coral could not possibly climb to the mountain top they must have been washed upon it while the mountain top was on a level with the sea we pondered this very much and we put to ourselves the question what raised the island to its present height above the sea but to this we could by no means give to ourselves a satisfactory reply jack thought it might have been blown up by a volcano and peterkin said he thought it must have jumped up of its own accord we also noticed what had escaped us before that the solid rocks of which the island was formed were quite different from the live coral rocks on the shore where the wonderful little insects were continually working they seemed indeed to be of the same material a substance like limestone but while the coral rocks were quite full of minute cells in which the insects lived the other rocks inland were hard and solid without the appearance of cells at all our thoughts and conversations on this subject were sometimes so profound that peterkin said we should certainly get drowned in them at last even although we were such good divers 
Nevertheless, we did not allow his pleasantry on this and similar points to deter us from making our notes and observations as we went along. We found several more droves of hogs in the woods, but abstained from killing any of them, having more than sufficient for our present necessities. We saw also many of their footprints in this neighborhood. Among these we also observed the footprints of a smaller animal, which we examined with much care, but could form no certain opinion as to them. Peterkin thought they were those of a little dog, but Jack and I thought differently. We became very curious on this matter, the more so that we observed these footprints to lie scattered about in one locality, as if the animal which had made them was wandering round about in a very irregular manner, and without any object in view. Early in the forenoon of our third day we observed these footprints to be much more numerous than ever, and in one particular spot they diverged off into the woods in a regular beaten track which was, however, so closely beset with bushes that we pushed through it with difficulty. We had now become so anxious to find out what animal this was and where it went to that we determined to follow the track and, if possible, clear up the mystery. Peterkin said, in a bantering tone, that he was sure it would be cleared up, as usual, in some frightfully simple way and proved to be no mystery at all. The beaten track seemed much too large to have been formed by the animal itself, and we concluded that some larger animal had made it, and that the smaller one made use of it. But everywhere the creeping plants and tangled bushes crossed our path, so that we forced our way along with some difficulty. Suddenly, as we came upon an open space, we heard a faint cry and observed a black animal standing in the track before us. "'A wild cat!' cried Jack, fitting an arrow to his bow, and discharging it so hastily that he missed the animal and hit the earth about half a foot to one side of it. To our surprise, the wild cat did not fly, but walked slowly towards the arrow and snuffed at it. "'That's the most comical wild cat I ever saw!' cried Jack. "'It's a tame wild cat, I think,' said Peterkin, leveling his spear to make a charge. "'Stop!' cried I, laying my hand on his shoulder. "'I do believe the poor beast is blind. See? It strikes against the branches as it walks along. It must be a very old one.' And I hastened toward it. "'Only think,' said Peterkin, with a suppressed laugh, "'of a superannuated wild cat.' We now found that the poor cat was not only blind, or nearly so, but extremely deaf, as it did not hear our footsteps until we were quite close behind it. Then it sprang round, and putting up its back and tail, while the black hair stood all on end, ordered a hoarse mew and a fuff. "'Poor thing,' said Peterkin, gently extending his hand and endeavoring to pat the cat's head. "'Poor pussy! Chee-chee-chee! Puss-puss-puss! Chee-dee-pussy!' No sooner did the cat hear these sounds than all signs of anger fled, and advancing eagerly to Peterkin it allowed itself to be stroked, and rubbed itself against his legs, purring loudly all the time, and showing every symptom of the most extreme delight. "'It's no more a wild cat than I am,' cried Peterkin, taking it in his arms. "'It's quite tame. Poor pussy, cheaty pussy!' We now crowded around Peterkin, and were not a little surprised, and, to say truth, a good deal affected by the sight of the poor animal's excessive joy. It rubbed its head against Peterkin's cheek, licked his chin, and thrust its head almost violently into his neck, while it purred more loudly than I ever heard a cat purr before, and appeared to be so much overpowered by its feelings that it occasionally mewed and purred almost in the same breath. Such demonstrations of joy and affection led us at once to conclude that this poor cat must have known man before, and we conjectured that it had been left either accidentally or by design on the island many years ago, and was now evincing its extreme joy at meeting once more with human beings. 
while we were fondling the cat and talking about it jack glanced round the open space in the midst of which we stood hello exclaimed he this looks something like a clearing the axe has been at work here just look at these tree stumps we now turned to examine these and without doubt we found trees that had been cut down here and there also stumps and broken branches all of which however were completely covered with moss and bore evidence of having been in this condition for some years no human footprints were to be seen either on the track or among the bushes but those of the cat were found everywhere we now determined to follow up the track as far as it went and peterkin put the cat down but it seemed to be so weak and mewed so very pitifully that he took it up again and carried it in his arms where in a few minutes it fell sound asleep about ten yards farther on the felled trees became more numerous and the track diverging to the right followed for a short space the banks of a stream suddenly we came to a spot where once must have been a rude bridge the stones of which were scattered in the stream and those on each bank entirely covered over with moss in silent surprise and expectancy we continued to advance and a few yards farther on beheld under the shelter of some breadfruit trees a small hut or cottage i cannot hope to convey to my readers a very correct idea of the feelings that affected us on witnessing this unexpected sight we stood for a long time in silent wonder for there was a deep and most melancholy stillness about the place that quite overpowered us and when we did at length speak it was in subdued whispers as if we were surrounded by some awful or supernatural influence even peterkin's voice usually so quick and lively on all occasions was hushed now for there was a dreariness about this silent lonely uninhabited cottage so strange in its appearance so far away from the usual dwellings of man so old decayed and deserted in its aspect that fell upon our spirits like a thick cloud and blotted out as with a pall the cheerful sunshine that had filled us since the commencement of our tour round the island the hut or cottage was rude and simple in its construction it was not more than twelve feet long by ten feet broad and about seven or eight feet high it had one window or rather a small frame in which a window might perhaps once have been but which was now empty the door was exceedingly low and formed of rough boards and the roof was covered with broad coconut and plantain leaves but every part of it was in a state of the utmost decay moss and green matter grew in spots all over it the woodwork was quite perforated with holes the roof had nearly fallen in and appeared to be prevented from doing so altogether by the thick matting of creeping plants and the interlaced branches which years of neglect had allowed to cover it almost entirely while the thick luxuriant branches of the breadfruit and other trees spread above it and flung a deep sombre shadow over the spot as if to guard it from the heat and the light of day we conversed long and in whispers about this strange habitation ere we ventured to approach it and when at length we did so it was at least on my part with feelings of awe at first jack endeavoured to peep in at the window but from the deep shadow of the trees already mentioned and the gloom within he could not clearly discern objects so we lifted the latch and pushed open the door we observed that the latch was made of iron and almost eaten away with rust in the like condition were also the hinges which creaked as the door swung back on entering we stood still and gazed around us while we were much impressed with the dreary stillness of the room but what we saw there surprised and shocked us not a little there was no furniture in the apartment save a little wooden stool and an iron pot the latter almost eaten through with rust in the corner farthest from the door was a low bedstead on which lay two skeletons embedded 
in a little heap of dry dust. With beating hearts we went forward to examine them. One was the skeleton of a man, the other that of a dog, which was extended close beside that of the man, with its head resting on his bosom. Now we were very much concerned about this discovery, and could scarce refrain from tears on beholding these sad remains. After some time we began to talk about what we had seen, and to examine in and around the hut, in order to discover some clue to the name or history of this poor man who had thus died in solitude, with none to mourn his loss save his cat and his faithful dog but we found nothing, neither a book nor a scrap of paper. We found, however, the decayed remains of what appeared to have been clothing and an old axe, but none of these things bore marks of any kind, and indeed they were so much decayed as to convince us that they had lain in the condition in which we found them for many years. This discovery now accounted to us for the tree stump at the top of the mountain, with the initials cut on it, also for the patch of sugar cane and other traces of man which we had met with in the course of our rambles over the island, and we were much saddened by the reflection that the lot of this poor wanderer might possibly be our own after many years' residence on the island, unless we should be rescued by the visit of some vessel or the arrival of natives." having no clue whatever to account for the presence of this poor human being in such a lonely spot, we fell to conjecturing what could have brought him there. I was inclined to think that he must have been a shipwrecked sailor, whose vessel had been lost here, and all the crew drowned except himself and his dog and cat. But Jack thought it more likely that he had run away from his vessel, and had taken the dog and cat to keep him company. We were also much occupied in our minds with the wonderful difference between the cat and the dog, for here we saw that while the one perished like a loving friend by its master's side, with its head resting on his bosom, the other had sought to sustain itself by prowling abroad in the forest, and had lived in solitude to a good old age. However, we did not conclude from this that the cat was destitute of affection, for we could not forget its emotions on first meeting with us, but we saw from this that the dog had a great deal more of generous love in its nature than the cat, because it not only found it impossible to live after the death of its master, but it must needs, when it came to die, crawl to his side and rest its head upon his lifeless breast. While we were thinking on these things, and examining into everything about the room, we were attracted by an exclamation from Peterkin. "'I say, Jack,' said he, "'here is something that will be of use to us.' "'What is it?' said Jack, hastening across the room. "'An old pistol,' replied Peterkin, holding up the weapon, which he had just pulled from under a heap of broken wood and rubbish that lay in a corner. "'That indeed might have been useful,' said Jack, examining it if we had any powder, but I suspect the bow and the sling will prove more serviceable. True, I forgot about that, said Peterkin, but we may as well take it with us, for the flint will serve to strike fire with when the sun does not shine. After having spent more than an hour at this place, without discovering anything of further interest, Peterkin took up the old cat, which had lain very contentedly asleep on the stool whereon he had placed it and we prepared to take our departure. In leaving the hut Jack stumbled heavily against the door-post, which was so much decayed as to break across, and the whole fabric of the hut seemed ready to tumble about our ears. This put it into our heads that we might as well pull it down, and so form a mound over the skeleton. Jack, therefore with his axe, cut down the other door-post, which, when it was done, brought the whole hut in ruins to the ground, and thus formed a grave to the bones of the poor recluse and his dog. Then we left the spot, having brought away the iron pot, the pistol, and the old axe, as they might be of much use to us hereafter.
During the rest of this day we pursued our journey, and examined the other end of the large valley, which we found to be so much alike to the parts already described that I shall not recount the particulars of what we saw in this place. I may, however, remark that we did not quite recover our formal cheerful spirits until we arrived at our bower, which we did late in the evening, and found everything just in the same condition as we had left it three days before. End of chapter 11 Recording by Tom Weiss